The term Flying Dutchman is used to refer to a ghostly vessel and its crew that have been doomed to sail the seas for eternity. The legend states that the crew will often come to warn of other vessels soon to be cursed. The Flying Dutchman has been a part of maritime legend for centuries, as many have claimed to see ghostly vessels and crew sailing the seas. All of these vessels claimed to have been seen remain a mystery as to their disappearance. But what about the Inland Ocean, or more commonly referred to as the Great Lakes? Well, there are many stories of the Flying Dutchman on the lakes, too, but the most common and most mentioned of all is that of the Bannockburn. The Bannockburn was a 1,620-ton steel hull freighter that was registered in Canada. The vessel often carried grain and had a unique profile that was easily recognizable to other freighters perhaps one of the reasons it became known as the Flying Dutchman of the Great Lakes. The vessel departed Fort William, Ontario, headed for the Sioux, loaded with 85,000 bushels of wheat on November 20th, 1902. But shortly after its departure, it ran aground and had to head back for port. No obvious damage was recorded upon inspection, but the vessel's departure would be delayed by a day. Following its delay, the Bannockburn would once again depart from Fort William, but this time without any immediate issues. Later on its journey, the ship would be spotted with binoculars by Captain James McMow of the vessel Algonquin. Captain McMow estimated its position to be 7 miles southeast of his vessel, 80 miles off Keweenaw Point, and 40 miles off Isle Royale. Some point shortly after, Captain McMow would try to spot her again, but couldn't find her. Shocked, he came to the conclusion that the weather prevented him from spotting the vessel, as it was not hard to distinguish the Bannockburn. The ship was launched in 1893 and measured 245 feet in length and 40 feet in width, and would be primarily used in the grain trade. The Bannockburn was built with a unique profile that certainly stood out from the rest of the freighters on the lakes at the time. This is most certainly why Captain McMahon was so shocked at losing sight of the vessel. As the Bannockburn continued down Lake Superior, a strong storm built, as this was common in November. The Bannockburn continued to sail onwards, being seen once again by another freighter, the Huronic. The sighting occurred around 11 o'clock p.m. on November 21st. The Night Watch pilot house crew of the Huronic had spotted the vessel's lights as it had passed their vessel and reported that it was most probably that of the Bannockburn. No incident occurred during the passing of the two vessels. Some of the crew members of the Huronic claimed that the storm was the worst of the season, as the engines of the ship were damaged by the storm. Although other freighters had claimed to have seen the vessel, this was the last confirmed reported sighting of the Bannockburn that day. After that, the ship would never be seen again. The vessel had vanished, with its crew of 21, into the storm. This had become apparent when the vessel did not report to the Sioux Locks, and the John D. Rockefeller had passed through debris from a vessel near Standard Rock Light. The Bannockburn and its crew were declared missing on November 30th of 1902, starting the legend of the Flying Dutchman on the Great Lakes. After the loss of the Bannockburn, many sailors on their vessels had claimed to have seen it and its crew on cold and icy nights, sailing with speed to no apparent destination. As for the reason for its sinking, there are several theories as to the disappearance of the ship. One was put forth by the captain of the Algonquin that the vessel may have had a boiler explosion. However, this was unlikely, as there was never any sounds of a boiler explosion heard, and none of the wreckage seen along the alleged course of the vessel was burnt. Another theory speculated that the hull was weakened. This was because they had found a hull plate that supposedly belonged to the Bannockburn after the draining of the Sioux locks. This would cause the vessel to have a major weakness during the storm and take on more water, likely sinking the vessel without knowledge from the crew as to why. A third suggests that the crew was inexperienced. 
Most of the crew members aboard were teenagers or young adults. The oldest of the crew was only 37, and that of Captain George Wood, while the youngest was 16. An experience on the Great Lakes was everything, as they were very unpredictable and there were many hazards. Experienced crews knew how to get their ships through the storms of the lakes, but often even many experienced crews fell to the power of the sea. However, hiring teenagers to work on vessels was not uncommon for this time, as young sailors were cheaper and more affordable. But the inexperience of the crew in November storms could have been what caused the Bannockburn to flounder. Yet another theory speculated that the vessel had struck the reef near Caribou Island, as there was no warning of the reef's location at the time of the vessel's sinking. This was due to the warning lights from the lighthouse at Caribou Island being turned off on November 15th. The ship could have rammed into the reef without warning and sank fast to the bottom. I think that the vessel's disappearance was a combination of several of these theories. The inexperience in location of islands, reefs, etc., and the inexperience in sailing from the crew led to the vessel's hull striking the reef of Caribou Island and causing it to sink fast as it was likely weakened due to the alleged loss of one of its hull plates. The vessel had also been involved in two major incidents before this, one of which was a collision at full speed with the rocks at Snake Island Lighthouse. No one died in the incident, and after unloading 30,000 bushels of grain, it was able to float again. But the Bannockburn had been heavily damaged in the ordeal. The second incident was on October 15, 1897, when it collided with the wall of Lock No. 17 in the Welland Canal, causing the vessel to fill up with 9 feet of water and sink to the bottom of the shallow canal. The ship was raised afterwards and sailed on. It is likely that these two incidents had an impact on its sinking on November 21st, 1902. But what do you think happened? Comment down below. But all that aside, the Bannockburn still remains a mystery and to this day has not been discovered or located. The search still continues and hopefully one day the Bannockburn will be discovered in the waters of Lake Superior and will uncover some secrets about its disappearance. But in the month of November, Lake Superior truly never gives up her dead. But anyways, thanks for watching this video. Subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.